I was at a, a Texas Christian University graduation once and the graduation speaker, a very conservative guy, uh, he said that in here in Texas, we still believe in markets and the whole place burst into applause. Uh, and I thought, what does that even mean? Uh, that that I felt like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, you know, that kind of creepy feeling you get when everyone's worshiping some uh, Cthulhu or whatever. Um, to me, the market's a tool. It would be like saying, here in Texas, we still believe in hammers. Well, yeah, we sure do. When we have a nail to drive into a piece of wood, we're crazy about hammers. But when we have a big piece of wood, we need to make into smaller piece of woods. We're kind of pro-saw. Um, and yet we attach all this sort of I mean, not just political, but, but religious significance to, to, to the embracement of capitalism. Um, and it's just a tool is all it is. This is the MNT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast, a podcast designed to demystify economics. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast and become a supporter of our work by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You just heard my guest this week, Professor of Economics and Forbes contributor John T. Harvey on the importance of picking the right tool for a given job. And just as John's tagline at Forbes reads, I want to explain how things work, not what you should believe. In this episode, John builds for us a clear view on how things work using one crucial tool, an accessible macroeconomic framework. John calls his school of thought macroeconomics done properly. And in this episode, you'll come to understand that John's macroeconomics done properly and MMT are in agreement in virtually all areas of substance. If you're new to MMT, I recommend listening to our early episodes. But if you want to plunge in on this episode, here's a quick jumping off point for you to think about. If you've got a five or ten pound note in your pocket, where did it come from? Well, if it's not counterfeit, it came from the UK government. Governments that create their own currency, like the UK, the US, Japan, Australia and Canada, to name a few, can never run out of their own currency and therefore can pay for whatever is for sale in that currency, including all idle labor. This means that keeping people unemployed is a policy choice and keeping public services underfunded is a policy choice for these governments. Saying a government that creates its own currency can never run out of that currency sounds like a point of logic and intuitively correct. And yet how many times have we heard our political leaders talking about government needing to tighten its belt in the name of fiscal responsibility when it comes to spending on the most vulnerable and powerless in society or improving education, health and infrastructure for all of us? We could be doing so much better and understanding macroeconomics is a way for you to empower yourself to demand better policy choices from our elected representatives. As ever, if our podcast raises any questions for you, please get in touch on Twitter at MMT Podcast, or there's a list of other ways to get in touch at the end of the show. This episode is part one of a two-part interview, and part two will be out next week. Okay, let's dive in. Hi, John. Welcome to the MMT Podcast. How are you? Very well, thank you, and thank you for having me on. My absolute pleasure. Um, Really looking forward to this chat. You must be the coolest economics teacher in in the world, certainly in the US, right? Well, let's say this. Uh, When I come in from work and I'm clearly in a good mood and my wife said, how's the day go? I say, it was great. I was hilarious. Um, (laughs) And uh, she, you know, did did the students learn anything? Oh, I don't know. Uh, but I was really funny today. So that's, that's, uh, I don't want to say it's my primary goal. I like to entertain as well as, uh, uh, as well as educate. That's exactly why I wanted to talk to you, John. Um, <laughs> so, um, just for anybody that's not heard of you, John, we use some opening remarks to lay out who you are for the listener. Yeah. Um, let's see. I went to the university of Tennessee for my PhD. And when I was there, it was a really great place for heterodox economics. They had um, uh, 
many of really you know really well known institutionalists. And then just as I was about to leave, they ended up with Paul Davidson, who's a major figure in in post Keynesian economic thought. And of course, MMT is a, you know derived from that. Um, and so then I got really lucky coming out of grad school because there, and I don't know how much you know listeners know this, but the really hard thing about generating new PhDs in our area is that you can't get a job, <laughs> and that you can't find a graduate program you know where we can train these people. Uh, and so I got really lucky and got a job where uh, actually the kind of research I did was was respected. And so I've been at TCU, uh, Texas Christian University. And by the way, it's not a Christian university in the sense that. Some other, you know, uh, everyone is is required to take one religion course. That is the only thing that it's sort of a holdover from the earlier days. But that religion course can be Rastafarianism, which is what my daughter took when she went to uh, TCU. <laughs> but so I got I got a great job. Um, and uh, for about 20, 25 years, I did nothing but exchange rate research uh, just because it was a big hole. Uh, and I found it very interesting. But then what my my true love has always been macro. Uh, and the, but the, even at Tennessee, and of course Paul David's a great macroeconomist, but he didn't get there till I was done with classes. So um, uh, I, really, I had a terrible background in macro. So everything I was learning, I was having to learn on my own. And so finally, about 10, 15 years ago, I started publishing uh, in, in, in macro, and um, now I'm living out my life's dream. So it's, it, it's not a Christian university in the sense you're thinking, how would Jesus do fiscal? Right, right, right. Although, honestly, that'd be a hell of a lot better than we do, but, you know, <laughs> cool. less. Um, so look, I thought I'd sketch out who I think our podcast series is for just to, uh, you know, for my own sake, as much as anything else, yeah. uh, I think there's a, not enough people, but there is a, a group of people globally. I think it, they're in reasonably advanced countries like the U S and the UK, and they've heard that we can't have nice things like a fully funded national health service or Medicare for all over there, uh, because our respective governments have run out of money. And I think intelligent right. people, hear that and they smell a rat because they think, well, the government response to the global financial crisis or military spending or Trump tax yeah. cuts, none of, none of this was attached to how you're going to pay for it. And uh, all of a sudden it's not scarce when it's spent on those things. But then right. when we want our, you know, our, our libraries and our schools and our hospitals uh, fully funded, uh, it, it goes away again. So I think the, the people who smell a rat, they, they know it's got something to do with economics because, you know, maybe a century ago political leaders might have gone to a cleric or a man of the cloth to create a talking point to, for keeping people in line but these days they go to an economist and go look this serious person wagging their fingers and and being depicted as very serious and scientific that they, <laughs> they've drawn a load of curves and they say no no we have to let a few people die or we have to let right, a few right. people live in poverty because it's just it's nature or something and um, yes. so I see you as one of the economists who are counter to that and so I, I wanted to ask you you know how do you respond to this idea, this notion that the US government or the UK government has or can even ever run out of money? Right. Uh, and, and there's a number of ways I like to start off. It kind of depends on <clears throat> what mood I'm in. Um, but, you know, because there's a couple of points there. One is the running out of money. Uh, and I've just recently come to saying, OK, let's see. The United States gets bombed in December 1941 to bring him into World War you know, II. Uh, and up to that point, of course, they've been through the worst economic disaster in, in uh, you know, the history of capitalism. And unemployment is still in, in, in uh, 1941 in the United States. It's still almost 10 percent which is the worst it's been, you know, since uh, you know, during the financial crisis and so forth. So 10 percent's not good. All right. So, well, then all of a sudden we have the U.S. has to, to, to ramp up deficit spending uh, at a level, the likes of which the country had never seen before. Where'd the money come from? I mean, did, did this come from the savings of the people who have 10 percent unemployment, who have just gone through this horrible period? Well, you know, how did they come up with this money? Now, they say bond drives and so forth, but that's not and I, I don't want to go into that right now. But and they just made it up. Uh, they just said uh, exactly as as commercial banks do, uh, which takes a bit of explaining. But but you know th they made up the money. They they print and I hate to say it this way because it it, it uh, triggers in people's minds many false uh, uh, you know, sort of visions of of what happens. But they printed the money. 
is what they did. Uh, and so, no, money, it, the, many things are in scarce supply. Money is not one of them. Uh, money, the, the private sector makes up money when it wants it. The government makes up money when it wants it. Are there consequences? Yeah. I mean, you know, and nobody is arguing otherwise. Can there be terrible inflation? Yes. And there would have been in the United States during World War II, had they not had, they raised taxes in order to take money away from people so they couldn't spend all this cash that was being created uh, in, in the, so the buildup of the military. Uh, they, they talked people into thinking they needed to buy war bonds. They didn't need to buy war bonds. I mean, they, but what that did was that prevented people from spending money in 1943 and made sure they couldn't spend it until 1946. And they sort of get this patriotic fervor. And if you look through documents of the day, it talks about over and over controlling inflation, controlling inflation, controlling inflation. They, they knew that's what, the, that, that's what the problem was. Convincing people to buy war bonds, for example, was, was not because they needed people's money. Why would you have needed their money? But um, I mean, certainly Hitler didn't worry about that. Certainly, you know, Mussolini didn't worry about, oh my gosh, where are we gonna get the money? Um, and neither did we. And so by getting people to buy war bonds, it wasn't to finance the war. It was to prevent them from spending money in 1943 on goods and services that were in extremely short supply. Because we're because they were being capacity. yeah and, and yeah terrible inflation and make them spend it in 1946 instead uh, when the government or when the economy was going to need a big spurt um, with the big shutdown in military spending. They needed something to keep the economy from uh, you know dropping into recession. Oh. So anyway. Yeah, all, all that stuff was about inflation. It wasn't about financing. And so, no, I mean, we, uh, just as much as we, well, and going back to, to, to the Great Depression, again, the U.S. Uh, was worried to death uh, about, gosh, we're getting all these big deficits and so forth. I guess we need to try to balance the budget. And they did this in 1937 when they had unemployment finally from 25 down to 14, and it caused unemployment to go back up to 19. So, yeah, you, you stop spending. But then suddenly when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, there is no, oh my gosh, we're spending too much money. That never came up. That was never an issue. It was only an issue when we were spending money to try to help people uh, recover from the depression. Then it was an issue. Then it was a problem. But fighting the Germans and the Japanese, and I'm sorry, I always want to make sure I include the lesser allies, uh, Italians, Bulgarians, Romanians, Hungarians, and Finns, um, fighting them, you know, well, well, yeah, we yeah, all the money we want for that. It's a truism, isn't it, that, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, and uh, we're <laughs> going, we're going through that that rhyming process right now. Um, but so I was going to say, I think when I was watching you, uh, oh, this was a couple of years ago, I think at least on YouTube. Uh, it was the first time I heard uh, the this golden rule of macroeconomics. I think, as you put it, someone's spending is someone else's income. And I saw you give this talk. It was quite quick but about on macro involving yeah. a population, an entrepreneur, and then something about Texans, which I don't want to spoil. Uh, <laughs> can you can you tell it for our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll start with it. And now you've you've uh, given me a good segue into the fundamental problem um, in the uh, capitalist system. Uh, and, and let me say this first. First of all, from the perspective of, of, of my school of thought, uh, markets are neither good nor bad. They're a tool. All right. Uh, and, and so you know, it, I, I was at a, a Texas Christian University graduation once and the graduation speaker, a very conservative guy, uh, he said that in here in Texas, we still believe in markets and the whole place burst into applause. Uh, and I thought, what does that even mean? Yeah. Uh, that that I felt like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. You know that kind of creepy feeling you get when everyone's worshiping some <laughs> uh, Cthulhu or whatever. Um, and so I, I thought, well, what does it? You know, it would be like to me the market's a tool. It would be like saying, here in Texas, we still believe in hammers. <laughs> well, yeah, we sure do. When we have a nail to drive into a piece of wood, we're crazy about hammers. But when we have a big piece of wood, we need to make it into smaller piece of woods. We're kind of pro saw, um, and yet we attach all this sort of—I mean, not just political, but but religious significance to to, to the embracement of capitalism. Um, and it's just a tool, is all it is. So, at any rate, uh, when I'm saying the fundamental flaw of capitalism here, it's not that I'm thinking, you know, well, we need to, to bring the system down. No, there's some things that work well, but we purge it of its defects, as as Keynes said. So, uh, getting back to the the, the fundamental problem, uh, and, and that is. Essentially, that for the private sector, labor is a cost. But for the private sector, labor is something they actively try to minimize. Now, uh, that's not a problem so long as our productivity isn't terribly high. But if we take a world, and this is the example I like to use when I speak to civic groups, and why do civic groups want me to come speak to them? Because I'm free. Uh, and so, 
what I, what I say is, okay, let's say we have an economy of just 10 people. All right? there, there's 10 willing workers, and I'm the entrepreneur in charge of this. And uh, let's make this a very simple world. Uh, th- there's no government sector. There's no foreigners. And as I always say, it makes for every Texan's dream. You know, no foreigners, no, no government, uh, or maybe every Brexiter's dream. I don't know. Uh, that, that, uh, certainly the, the, the no foreigners part. <laughs> And so, so we just have the private sector. The private sector is the only thing, our domestic private sector is the only thing we have that can uh, keep our economy, that can employ people and keep our economy going. All right, so I'm the entrepreneur. Uh, how many of these 10 people would I like to hire? Well, I'd like to hire as many as it takes to produce enough goods and services to satisfy the market, which is uh, a problem if it turns out, for example, that I only need seven of those people to produce enough goods and services to satisfy 10 people, uh, and this is you know, the, the terrible irony, I have the capacity to produce for all 10, but it is only profitable to hire seven of those people because anything that the last three would make, well, nobody wants that. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think a really good example for people is agriculture, uh, that there was a time in homo sapien uh, history, or so I assume, I had to ask my daughter, who was the anthropology major, uh, that, you know, we pretty much spent most of our time, uh, perhaps in a, in a leisurely way, but hunting and gathering, you know, that, that everyone had to basically sort of farm. Um, and then as technology increased, uh, farming technology increased. So now today in the United States, I think it's about 2% of the population is involved in farming. So Two percent can make enough food for themselves and the other ninety-eight percent, and then we put half of it down the garbage disposal. On top of that, so you know, uh, ag- if we talk about any sector where we absolutely need that sector, it's agriculture. But we don't need everybody. So what if the only thing you could sell to people was food? Well, we get saturated. We don't want more food. There's a point at which we're full, um, and but we only need you know a fraction of the people who were going to be representing the demand to uh, produce enough for everyone. So going back to my 10 people, what if I only need seven people to produce enough goods and services for the 10 people? Well, I'm going to leave three people unemployed. Am I a jerk? No, that's the way the system is set up. I I, I have a family too. I have to make a profit. I, I Maybe I have stockholders. So I only hire seven of them. Um, and yet the irony is that even though I can make enough food for the other three, they don't have any money. So they can't buy it. So I don't even hire all seven because there are among those seven are the people who are making the the goods and services for the last three who don't have enough income. Uh, And so and and just to make the math simple, I usually drop it back to six. I know that uh, it doesn't make sense that one person is making enough for three. But just to uh, give a sense of the example. So not only do I not hire those last three, I also don't hire the person that would have been the one making the goods and services for those last three. And yet I have the capacity. All right. I have the capacity. It, it, It describes very well. Uh, what happened over the 1920s in the United States, a huge increase in, in productivity, uh, and including in agriculture, and a shift towards the market sector. But then by the 1930s, the 1930s should have been the most glorious economic period in U.S. economic history because we had such high levels of, of uh, capital. We had built up factories and so forth uh, and productivity. Everyone should have enjoyed you know, an even better period than the Roaring Twenties. But in fact, it was just the opposite because we had to lay off those three people. Because once we had all the factories built and so forth, uh, we didn't need them anymore. Uh, and so then you have the problem of, okay, well, we have the capacity and we today, I mean, there's no question we have the capacity, especially in the developed world, to, to, to generate a, a, a decent living for everybody in the United States, in the UK, Ireland, uh, uh, Greece. Uh, without question, we have the capacity. The problem is that we assume that the market system is the only possible solution to generating employment. And so then you get into, okay, well, uh, what if, uh, and by the way, when when I go over this talk with people, and you know, most Texans are pretty conservative, and and when you build it one piece at a time like that, they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And before you know it, they're agreeing with, you know, let's increase government spending, and then they have to go home and take a shower, I guess. But (laughs) um, but they, uh, they, you know, they, they sort of... And I'm not trying to sneak it in on them. I'm trying to build the case. But when you build the case one piece at a time, all of a sudden they're like, well, yeah, that does kind of make sense. Um, so 
At any rate, now, let's go back to the scenario of the 10 people, four of whom are not working, even though we have the capacity. Well, what can we do about this? Well, we have no uh, uh, foreign sector. We can't be like Germany or China and depend on on that to uh, increase employment for us by having by generating a trade surplus. Uh, and in fact, if we leave it to the private sector, we're done. So let's introduce a government sector and let's have the government sector hire those three people who are unneeded uh, in the private sector as, I don't know, I, I usually use a Marine, uh, a, a teacher and a police officer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now we're, you know, we're paying them and they have the income to pay me, which is just fine by me. Uh, and then I also have to hire that last person I didn't hire. All right. So. Now, uh, you think, and and again, with my audience, usually they're like, okay, okay, that that makes sense. Uh, You know, now we can certainly have a political argument over what we want those three people to do. And and that's a perfectly fair point. You know, Uh, do we want them to, uh, apparently, where was it? In Prague, they had a parade of of Monty Python's Silly Walk earlier. Uh, And and of course, uh, uh, you know, John Cleese is running the department uh, that I guess funds silly walks uh, in the episode. Do we want to? Do we want to fund that? Probably not. You know, but but that, that that's a that's a legitimate question. Uh, but it doesn't sort of change the underlying problem that if we don't do something. Those four people go without when we have the ability to produce for them. So, uh, so again, usually people are with me up to this point. I say, okay, let's just say the government just prints the money. All right. So, uh, and then you start thinking to yourself, well, okay, but gosh, they can't do that forever. All right. That that's all. And and it is unfortunate that in the back of people's minds, there. Are, you know, Keynes says in the in the preface to the general theory that what I'm saying here in this book is extremely simple and should be obvious. The problem is you've already learned something else. So not only do I have to teach you the new thing, I've got to pull the old thing out of your head, which is much more difficult because um, you don't even realize which, which assumptions you're taking for granted. So what, happen, what happens then is, you know, well, first of all, you say, you know, well, but, but deficit spending, that's bad, isn't it? Uh, and so what I do is I, I, I do a little video or, or a, a, a um, visual rather of two individuals, uh, one of whom has spent $150 paying the other person. The, you know, the entire economy is just these two people. One spends $150, the other spends $100. So one of them ends up with a $50 surplus and one ends up with a $50 deficit. Which, by the way, is the way it has to be. One person's spending is another person's income. Uh, and one person's deficit is another person's surplus. And so I ask, who would you rather be? Would you rather be the person with the surplus or the person with the deficit? And they always say, I'd rather be the person with the surplus. And then I hit the slide and it switches to not two people, but the private sector and the public sector. And I say, okay, well, that's who you are. When the public sector has a deficit, you have a surplus. And when the public sector has a surplus, you have a deficit. And now, again, I'm, now I'm playing to my crowd here in Texas, but I then attack Bill Clinton, and they're all just fine with that. <laughs> but there's a lot of current day progressives who get that as oh, well. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Know. Oh, quite right. No, I've spoken to Democrat groups as well that, that uh, have been either kept their mouths shut or, or you know, agreed. Uh, but yeah, it, it plays well, especially with your local civic groups that are, are you know pretty conservative. Cool. And so we know, well, geez, th- those couple, last couple of years of the Clinton administration with these big surpluses that that everyone wants to claim credit for, and then I show them the sectoral balances thing of of uh, how much private sector debt skyrocketed during those years, which of course it did. If the government taxed more than it spent, it's absorbing income. All right. So it's so so that, you know, that's the next point I usually make in, in my talk. OK, the private sector isn't going to hire everyone. Uh, we could solve this problem with, you know, a, a teacher, a Marine and a police officer. Uh, but that's deficit spending. Isn't deficit spending bad? Um, yeah. OK, it is. But you're surplus spending. You're on the surplus side of it. Um, so, you know, you're, you're on the side you want to be. And then they say, well, OK, OK, even if they buy it up to there. But how long can the government do that? And the answer to that is forever. I'm sorry, I, I should say this. How long can the United States do that before it has to default? Because uh, th- there are other issues. Yes. But default is completely and totally off the table. Any money that the United States owes in dollars, uh, it can always pay. And th- this is one of the, you, know, you hate to do uh, logic-wise, you hate to do appeal to authority, but this is a legal question. Uh, and so I do appeal to authority at this point, and I show uh, two or three slides full of quotes. Uh, 
from Federal Reserve Bank chairs, from uh, uh, you know Treasury Department officials, from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, from private investors, from academics, all saying, "Oh yeah, the United States can't default. That, that that's impossible." And not not in. I mean, you know, if we borrow pesos, yes, we could default. If we borrowed yen, yes, we could default. But we're quote unquote borrowing in dollars. And so we can never go bankrupt in that. Uh, and, and so, no, that's off the table. So then you say, OK, all right. And again, I'm trying to, you know, I, I've done this talk so many times now. My, my poor wife, because she usually comes with me and sees it again. But she's usually the one I call on. Can anyone tell me the likelihood that the United States default on the debt? Yes, you, young lady. Is it zero? No. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so. She's up on my plant in the audience. Uh, but, um, you know, at this point, if you've still got them with you, and, and quite, you know, even Melanie, my wife, said it took her three or four times watching this talk to just like, ah, oh, to finally sink in. Because it's a lot to take in at once because it challenges so many conventional wisdoms. Uh, and, you know, I, I've gotten criticism now and then on my Forbes blog from, from uh, uh, you know, people who are sympathetic where they say, but you didn't say so and so too. Oh my God, you can't say too much at once. You know, you you have to. You know, in my talk, I end up challenging a number of things. You know, because I can I can do a, a question and answer. Um, but in the blog, boy, you don't want to try to challenge too much at once. Uh, and uh, it's great the way you take people through one stage at a time because it is like you know you you know everything that you've just laid down every bullet point you can go right. Any questions? No, because really. Yeah. Everything you've said is a point of logic, just about. And especially on the U.S. can't default part. I mean, that one, uh, again, I, I, I hate to try to defend myself with just a page full of quotes, but it's like, oh, that's from Alan Greenspan. Oh, you know, that, that's from uh, a publication at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. You'd think they'd know what they were talking about when I say that, uh, and other times they don't, but <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, so, you know, at this point then, you're like, okay, well, then how much should we spend? Uh, and and the, 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 you know, if we can spend as much as we want, and then this is where people then make this leap, I guess, to people that are particularly antagonistic to the idea, well, then we just spend forever. Well, and this is an example I've just, or an analogy I've just recently come up with. Um, okay, let's say you found a, 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 a petrol station or a gas station, whichever country we're in, um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the the air, I don't know, uh, in the UK, uh, usually you have to pay some money to get the air to refill your tires. Uh, yeah, we have that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah they, what if there's we, a station where it was free? We have to pay for air now, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> what if there was a station where it was free? What would you do? Would you keep on filling the tires till they exploded? Or would you stop when you reached your goal that was not related to how much money it was, because that's irrelevant now, uh, but is instead related to, uh, you know, well, I, I want to put enough air in the tires to, for the tires to be safe. So how much money does the government spend in pursuit of generating employment? Well, until those other three people are hired and then you stop. All right. You know, th there's no need that to, you know, now, can we do that forever? Yes. But does it mean we spend as much as we want anytime we want? Well, no, we spend, well, but put it this way, how much we want to spend is enough to generate full employment, period. Um, and then we get these people, well, but if you increase the money supply, that will decrease the value of the currency. And oh my God, that's a hard one to beat out of people because cause I used to believe it. I mean, you know, that's one thing I, I find uh, a lot of our, our MMT supporters online are more like assassins than 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 diplomats, and we need diplomats because people aren't stupid. Yeah. People are, you know, they're ignorant. They just don't know. So lay these things out in a friendly manner, um, and if they still don't want to believe it, fine, move on to the next person because you're wasting your time. But you know, you lay these things out in a friendly manner. Um, and, and as you said, you do one point at a time, uh, and these things seem, you know, terribly logical piece by piece. Uh, and don't, I, I, I've seen these, you know, and again, I, it's not a majority, but, you know, the, basically saying people are stupid for not believing uh, MMT. Well, they haven't heard it. Uh, yeah. and, and the people they have heard it from are detractors who don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think that's where the, the MMT assassins come from. It's, it's like, they're trying to counter that because they they just feel like they're always on the defensive. Whereas my tactic is I'm always looking for the low hanging fruit. I'm looking for people who are, like I said at the beginning, they, they know that they, they're going to have to d understand macroeconomics at some point, because just to have any basic progressive policy 
pushed through now, you, you're you going to have to justify where to find the money from. So then you have to go, all right, what is money? And then you, you know, you start reading, eventually you find Kelton and Mosler and you and people like that. And, uh, and, and, and then, and then you're like, all right, I, can't, I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I can't, I can't, you know, yeah. it, even then when you're open to it, you're like, I can't believe it. And you could, you spend a bit of time pushing back and you find out what happened in right. Weimar. You find out what happened in Zimbabwe and, you know, and, and um, yeah, it takes a fair bit. And then once you're there, you you yeah. go back to people who you think might be interested in it and they're they're just working from uh, what you just described before which is i guess the quantity theory of money yes this this uh, idea that like if you just if you make some more of it magically it will it, you know the value of it the price level will go down i mean do you want to dive right. into that do you want to go down that rabbit hole now yeah no i have a um, actually i think it's my most read second most read Oh no, third. I did one on the on the situation in Greece and apparently it became very popular in Greece. So I had lots ah, of reads great. on that one. But I have two on inflation. Um, one on money growth doesn't cause inflation and one on what does cause inflation. Those are absolutely two of my most read. Um, but these are all these are not things I learned in graduate school myself. And, and you're describing this this process of of sort of the 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 you know scales falling from your eyes and and, and finally you know saying, gosh, that that makes sense. But I'm going to have to let it sit there for a while, you know, and, and sort of churn through. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, my, my graduate level macroeconomics education was so bad that I thought about quitting the program. Uh, okay. And I thought because I thought, well, this is going to be we're going to learn about business cycles. But mainstream economists don't think business cycles exist. Uh, they think that there are exogenous shocks that happen now and then. A anyway, but um, then I came across a book. Alfred Eichner, who was a wonderful man, by the way, died, died way too young, uh, very, very active uh, post-Keynesian. Alfred Eichner is a guide to post-Keynesian economics. And I read that and I thought, well, now I know what I'm going to do. I'll put up with your crap here in grad school, which, again, was ironic because we had the, all these, you know, institutionalists, and, but they weren't teaching the macro classes. Um, but, yeah, it took me a long time. And honestly, it was probably 20 years into – I've been at TCU for 32 years now – it was probably 20 years in before I said to myself, I think I've got it all figured out now. I think all the pieces make sense to me now. Uh, and, and, you know, that it just because, again, you're trained the other way. Uh, and all these things that you took completely for granted, you never questioned uh, and you should have been. Uh, but, you know, that's another thing, too, with, with economics students, we tend to beat out of them questioning the assumptions. When you first take an economics course, uh, let's assume so-and-so, let's assume so-and-so, let's assume so-and-so. Well, people who aren't okay with that just don't major in economics. People who enjoy the modeling part of it, uh, like me, um, so, okay, well, this is kind of interesting. Surely at the graduate level, we ease up on those assumptions. Nah, we did the opposite. <laughs> we had even more restrictive assumptions, but now we used calculus instead of algebra. Uh, so Yeah, I spoke to Stephen Hale from uh, Australia oh, uh, yes. um, maybe a few months ago, and it's uh, one of our episodes, and it's, he said the same thing, and that kind of led him to write his book, um, Economics for Sustainable Prosperity. And uh, right at the beginning, he talks about the difference between hard economics and soft economics and uh and and just this he he had the same experience as you thinking yeah surely these wild assumptions get eased up right. in the next stage and they never do and you but what you're no, saying is even no. worse than that they run the other way and put on a load of yeah. other things no i remember in my this is the example i always use when i when we give talks and so forth in my international trade theory phd level course um it was highly mathematical. All we did was invert matrices and multiply this column by the other column and so forth. And we were in there with the hotshot finance guys. Uh, uh, graduate students were supposed to be a lot better than us. Well, may I tell your audience, I earned the highest grade in the class. I'm very proud. Um, <laughs> and I was standing at the grocery store in the, in the line at the grocery store not too long afterwards. And I suddenly thought to myself, if the people here in line knew I just finished a PhD level course in international trade, I wouldn't be able to answer a single question they would logically have. Um, who are our trading partners? I, I don't know. Um, what do we export? Well, sometimes we export X and sometimes we export Y. Uh, it depends on how the equations worked out. Um, I knew none of that. I knew I didn't know what things we imported and exported. And furthermore, you can have a wonderfully successful career as an international trade theorist, never learning any of those things. Because um, it's, it's the math. So, But again, I, 
my first major was physics. I don't dislike math. I quit physics because I thought it was horribly boring. But nevertheless, sometimes you get this from the mainstream that, uh, well, you guys just don't understand math. Okay, have a look at Steve Keen's stuff. Steve is, uh, uh, he, he won, yeah, he, he won the award for the um, person who most accurately forecast the financial crisis. Everyone says, oh, economists didn't predict it. Well, put in the word neoclassical or mainstream in front of economists, and you're absolutely right. But no, there were economists who absolutely were saying, uh, and Steve Keen's story is, is really fantastic, if I may take a moment to tell that. He published a piece in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics in 1995, in the middle of the longest peacetime expansion in U.S. at that point in U.S. economic history, uh, and all about the dangers of private sector debt and, and the debt to income ratios going up. And he built this, you know, wonderful dynamic model of the economy that he simulated on the computer, you know, page after page of equations, um, which doesn't isn't good or bad. The point is. He can do it. <laughs> and, and he did it in a way that he didn't assume away, you know, all, all of the real world problems, uh, including the existence of a financial sector, which is often assumed away in neoclassical models. Um, and he came to the conclusion that, you know, a, a, an economy with this accumulating private sector debt uh, will eventually reach crisis point and a crisis point from which it will be extremely difficult to, to, to uh, recover. So uh, he's then doing expert testimony years later in Australia. And he said that the next day he was going to say, and here in Australia, and I don't, I don't remember why, but here in Australia, the debt to income ratio has gone up, you know, uh, X percent. And he said, you know, I don't know that's actually true. I should look it up before I say it in court tomorrow. So he looked it up. He's like, wow, it's even worse than I thought. Uh, he said, but wait a minute. That's just Australia. Let's check the United States. Well, it's worse in the United States than it is in Australia. He dropped everything else he was doing um, and started his blog. Uh, uh, the debt, debt watch, watch, is it? Yeah, yeah. And, yes, and we're talking, yes. of course, we're talking private sector debt, not public sector debt. Right. Yeah. Precisely. Private sector debt is a problem. Um, and uh, you know, and, and and what did he use? His paper from 1995. He used those basic ideas. Uh, and, and so I just, you know, I always bring that up when people are like, "Well, what's our goal here as economists?" Uh, and that is to you know try to explain the real world. And, and I mentioned something in passing that that if I th this will act absolutely shock many listeners. When I when I mentioned in passing that mainstream models typically don't include a financial sector, that is. Absolutely true. And they recognize it themselves in the immediate aftermath of the financial sector. There were all kinds of mea culpas, you know, that, oh, well, gosh, I guess we should have had a more you know, sophisticated financial sector or perhaps one at all. Um, and they assume away from it because their basic starting point is that the economy self-corrects. That if you leave the private sector alone, it will tend to generate full employment automatically. Well, so the financial sector, there's really nothing left interesting left for it to do other than to sort of passively supply funds. So we just leave it out of the model altogether. Um, yeah. And uh, that that's total elephant in the room. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's not changed. It's not changed. Uh, it looked like it would for a couple of years and then they, <laughs> they've switched uh, back again. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's um, a bit like the journalists after the WMD scandal before the Iraq invasion, they just, you know, uh, uh, you know, maybe 10 years after they were sort of going, yeah, we're going to be more skeptical in future. And then a couple of years after that, right. now nah, let's bomb Libya. I'm pretty sure everything right. it needs bombing, you know? Um, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know what they're like. Yeah. Journalists, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it keep, I, and I'm sure that, that your, your listeners and you, you keep thinking to yourself, gosh, oh, I, it feels like we're on a knife's edge. If I may quote Galadriel from um, Lord of the Rings, uh, the movie at any rate, um, <laughs> Yeah, I tear up um, uh, at a number of points, in the, which is not a joke, by the way. Uh, but I, I actually wear a ring that is the one ring. Um, Twenty dollars on Amazon. If only, if only Sauron had known this, uh, then the history would have been very different. But uh, um, oh, good lord, I've totally lost my train of thought. This, this happens in class too, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, but what was I talking about? Oh, the knife edge. The knife edge. That. that you keep thinking to yourself, God, 30 years ago, I couldn't see this coming. Um, I mean, the, 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 and I don't know how bad it is in the UK. I know, the, the, uh, you know, I was born there and I have family there. Uh, and so when I go back and I watch their news, it's like, oh, my God, it's like listening to the news at home. I thought it was better over here. Um, 
but uh, the, the whole anti-vaxxer thing, the, the the rejection of the of the climate change stuff. Uh, I, I never. You know, I was thinking when you were doing your introductory statement about you know in a, a olden times leaders turned to religious you know folks to, for their advice. Yeah, we still do that here in the U.S. Uh, and so, and it's horrifying. I, I, I and yet the solution is so close at hand, um, and it's not that hard. Uh, but it's a philosophical shift we must have in order to take that solution. And maybe that's the hardest kind of shift of all. I don't know. Let's turn to your recent Forbes article, um, uh, MMT, Sense or Nonsense, which I, I recommend when I'm out there in the Twitter sphere, when people have objections, I always go, well, just read this one first, because your objection might fall into uh, a lot of these these common ones, and these are the serious ones. But but first of all, let's talk about, if, if you can do this, uh, uh, lay out MMT, or as you call it, macroeconomics done pop properly. Uh, right. And, uh, and uh, in the article, you open up with um, the core problem to be solved. Yes. And and if I may back up even further than that, my motivation for writing that. Um, I because, remember you said you wrote it angry. <laughs> yes. It came out. I wrote written. it angry. Yeah. That's right. I was tired. I. Uh, I, I've just, I don't feel like I've stopped. Uh, anyway, I was really tired. I didn't want to write something and I was just mad, uh, mad at the, uh, you know, Kenneth Rogoff and, um, uh, oh, what's his name? The guy, Paul Krugman and Larry Summers, these mainstream economists who were laying into MMT. Well, Rogoff, given, you know, the, the spreadsheet error thing, yes, that was after, you know, <laughs> right uh, now you tell I, us, you know, I mean, it's yes, like, how, how, how does he get off <laughs> right, <laughs> at this right. point? But anyway, you know, back, back yeah, to the yeah, story. So yeah, so I was just really angry, and, and I thought, well, if I'm going to, um, you know, in some of my pieces, I really think out, you know, sort of driving around town, that sort of thing. This one, I just kind of sat down and said, OK, well, what do I want to do? Well, first, I guess you need to lay out what it is um, before you go into, you know, well, why are these objections baseless? And uh, yeah, the, the basic fundamental problem is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for the private sector, uh, labor's a cost. And there's absolutely no reason to expect them to hire everyone who was willing to work, nor should we criticize them for not doing so. That's the way that part of the world is set up. We set it up that way. Um, and so we can't complain that, you know, your local, uh, uh, you know, your local fish and chip shop doesn't double their employees when, in fact, they have plenty right now to supply. Uh, but the, the best one at my near my nan's fish and chip shop was also a Chinese restaurant. And we could never figure out whether or not there was some connection or not but you know it, 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 but, but uh, they use the same grease or something like that but it's excellent but uh, we should not criticize them uh, for not hiring you know double the number of workers so so there, there's there's your problem there is the base thing to be solved what are we going to do about the fact that we have the productive capacity to produce well easily a decent standard of living for everyone Certainly in developed economies and in the developing economies, if we could solve many of the political problems, many of which that were started by the Europeans, to, you know, in, in the first place, uh, for example, in Africa, dividing up Africa in a way that was convenient for Belgium and, you know, France and so and, and England and so forth. Um, so, so that you ended up cutting off, you know, different tribal lines and so forth. But it's certainly in the, in, in the developed world. So. How are we going to solve that? Well, then the uh, basic answer is that there, the private sector should handle um, things that are profitable, but not necessarily of social benefit. They don't have to be of social benefit, just just profitable. Uh, and I, I, my own personal opinion is that reality television is not terribly uh, uh, socially beneficial. Um, uh, certainly, a, another debatable point is whether or not pornography is is uh, socially beneficial, but it's certainly private sector. The government does not subsidize. Well, no, apparently the Clintons do in the basement <laughs> of some pizza place. And, but, but otherwise, the public sector should handle things that are socially beneficial, but not profitable. The, the government should not get into the business of doing things that, that generate profit. For example, uh, we don't need a, a chain of, of government, uh, you know, you know, fish and chip shops. We don't need a chain of government hamburger stands. The private sector does that pretty well. So then we go through the whole uh, funding. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. And that is that, well, people have the wrong impression of the way the government spends money. They have the idea that they borrow the money. But if you just sit for a moment and think about that, it just doesn't make sense. 
uh, that, that they would even need to. Now, can the government do so? Absolutely. Uh, they can do so. Uh, do governments sometimes do that? Certainly at the state and local level, that is exactly what they do. Uh, the, uh, the, the state of Texas doesn't print its own currency. Uh, the city of Arlington here in Texas doesn't print its own currency. And so when the Dallas Cowboys wanted the new stadium, they had to have a bond uh, sale. And so they had to borrow the money. So uh, certainly it happens. But A, and this is when there's actually a big argument right now going on uh, between a number of, of post-Keynesian scholars, uh, among a number of post-Keynesian scholars, uh, on one of the lists uh, about MMT. And, and uh, gosh, it just I'm glad it's being kept in private because it's not any issues that actually change the conclusions. It's more of an argument about how much does the government really borrow and stuff like that. It's like, OK, those are technical issues. And, and the, the, you know, the, the bottom line is they don't have to. Even if they are right now, they certainly don't have to. Uh, they do just print the money into existence and then tax it back out uh, to um, prevent inflation and maintain interest rates. So, you know, people sometimes ask, is this limited to, say, the United States uh, or, or developed economies? Possibly. It may be. It, well, certainly the scale uh, may be an issue. I don't know. I don't know enough to speak on it. You probably already know about this, but Fidel Kaboob is doing great work on or he's doing great talks for the lay people right. like me about monetary sovereignty and the spectrum yes. of it so and, uh, and he's a really nice person oh I yeah him. yeah i love him to bits <laughs> yeah and uh yeah he's been on with us a couple of times yeah he's uh yeah he's a great guy but yeah. he um he will give an mmt talk but then you know he's also developed these these four points of of monetary sovereignty can you print your own currency yes can you tax in that currency yes but then do you have debts right. written in a foreign currency well if you do yeah you may have a problem you, your sovereignty your monetary sovereignty is slipping away and uh, you know the, right. we see the difference between the uk economy the us economy and the economy of uh, venezuela for instance right uh, right and, and so it was kind of just to just to go a bit further into that he's he's developed a great talk so i you know I, any listeners who are uh, you know uh, got have questions in their minds about like it, does it only apply to the us that that uh, look at fidel's work or one of our earlier podcasts i think it's episode 11 uh, with Fidel, and he really goes into this in, in detail. But I think then another thing that comes up uh, when you start talking about MMT, you lay it out and people go, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, I get that. And, uh, you know, you might go through the causes of hyperinflation and you just about answer that question. Ultimately, if you get them all the way to the other end of that, eventually they'll say something about, well, robots are doing everything now, or they soon will be. Uh, so, you, you know, why are you trying to create make work for everybody with your job guarantee? Something that comes up when you give talks, uh, which I really like, is you say something along the lines of, so long as we have social problems that aren't profitable, yes. national defense, police, fire protection, infrastructure repair, public education, cleaning, yada, yada, yada. That yeah. As long as we've got social problems, we've got employment opportunities. Um, Precise. I, yeah. And, and let me, if I may... Um, yeah, that, there, there actually are some, some post-Keynesians who are, are against the idea of, of a job guarantee. Uh, I, I couldn't, well, I wouldn't point them out uh, right now, but I can't think of anybody in, in particular, but I know I've seen the objection. Well, you know, the ro the robots are coming talking point really j then goes to like, well, so you should just give us money instead of giving us a job, give us money so that we can, right. so we can just consume without having that onerous thing of... Uh, of working because there's nothing to do and it's like I, right. I don't know if you've noticed the planet's burning down i think everybody's agreed on that yeah. everybody that's well, uh, rational and you have to think in terms you have to have a broader concept of jobs well let me back up and and, and talk about uh, two things there um one is the, oh, the whole idea that the, that the job guarantee, and, and I guess maybe if the listeners, we've sort of jumped ahead a little bit here. Uh, the idea is that for those three people out of the 10 that I described earlier, where there's a Marine, a, a police officer, and, and a public school teacher, whenever there's a situation where you can't find a job in the private sector, the government guarantees you a job. Um, it doesn't guarantee you an income. It's not a universal basic income. They guarantee you a job. All right. So, uh, and I want to address two things with that. The first is, well, gosh, that's like slavery. When you're not giving me a choice, the private sector doesn't give you a choice. Why well, isn't that like slavery? I mean, I, I, I tell my students, were you allowed to major in whatever you wanted to major in without having to worry about getting a job? 
Is there, you know, would you have preferred to major in history? Would you have preferred to major in art? But you didn't have a choice, did you? You had to major in something that you thought to yourself, especially nowadays with the, with the terrible student loan problem in the U.S., I have to worry about getting a job. Uh, I, I have to make sure that I'm going to get training. I'm not going to be able to, to, to expand my frontiers and, and pursue my interests without thinking to myself, too, they better be profitable. I better be de- Developing skills that an entrepreneur is going to find useful. So it is no, you know, it's not like the private sector doesn't already do that. Okay, but that that, that sounds like well, okay, but that's two badges then instead of instead of just one bad. The other thing is, though, that uh, you know, yes, we we could guarantee an income to people, but who's going to take care? Th- th- there are so many social problems that the private sector will never address. The private sector is never going to address. Uh, uh, child and, and I don't know what they call it, the UK, child and uh, social services, uh, where you have you know, cases of abuse. I, I was on a, uh, a little uh, sort of a quick radio interview one time, and uh, I was going to be on there with a, with a libertarian Austrian type. And so, well, I, I cheated. I looked up his research before I talked so I could know kind of, you know, what he was going to say. And he was a very nice man, a very nice man. But, but I, I brought up the whole, you know, child and social services thing. And the, the interviewer, kept pushing him back on that. Yeah, but what about that? Well, the charity. Okay, so these little kids that are, you know, and I, I bring up a story that I watched on, I don't know if you ever got this series in the UK. Um, it was uh, Unsolved Mysteries, uh, hosted by Robert Stack, the guy that used to be on The Untouchables, a right. TV series back in the uh, 60s, I guess. Um, and they would talk about, you know, if you or anyone you know uh, can solve, solve this mystery. And one of them was about, it was really a sad story, uh, the, these these two children whose uh, mother and stepfather had abandoned them. They were trying to find out where they were. And so in the course of telling the story, uh, they say that they talk to the child and family services people uh, there in Florida where they were. And they say, well, we, we do know there was you know, abuse, uh, allegations of, a, of, of sexual abuse of the, of the daughter by the stepfather. And they said, well, why didn't you do anything about it? So there's two of us in our office and we get 3,000 you know, <laughs> cases a year. We did what yeah. we could with two people. Um, oh, my God, who would argue that that's not a useful thing to have in society? My, my wife, uh, where she teaches, she teaches fourth grade. And, you know, I, I don't know. Again, I don't know if it's the same thing in the U.K., but 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 um, teen suicides are going up. Teen teen uh, mental health problems are, are are doubling. Not not just going up. Oh, they're ten percent worse than last year. No, they're like double what they were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and um, do you know American kids are genuinely scared of getting shot at school. Um, and I find it yeah. difficult to conceptualize that. But my own daughter, th- th- there was a, um, a an alarm, a, an alert at, at my university. And she wasn't even going to school there anymore, but she still got the text alert and she was scared. Um, and, and it's something that they think about, apparently. So, you know, we've got this pressure, apparently, with the social media, we've got the you know, bullying, we've got these kids taking on terrible debt, we've got their parents being stressed, all these terrible things. Going back to my wife and, and her school, they have counselors at school. And you know what they do? They fill out forms all day, is all they do. They don't have enough people to actually counsel students. Counselors no longer counsel. Boy, that would be a terrible thing, wouldn't it, to pay somebody to do that? Yeah. And I'm sorry, people who would just like to have the universal basic income, but we have problems, and we are a social unit. Homo sapiens are social animals. We're a tribe, and our tribe has problems. And we're not just going to give you a share of the elk uh, just because you're a member of our tribe. You also kind of need to help out. Yeah. Now, you know, you, yeah, you may disagree that this is a problem where we need help. Okay, well, then get involved in politics and push for something else. But we have serious problems. Elder care uh, is not something that's ever going to be solved by the private. My nan, uh, in in her you know last few years, uh, in, back when when you know national health and everything wasn't cut as badly as it is today, she had a couple of, of, of nurses would stop by every day to check in on her, uh, every day. Um, yeah, and we you know you know one of the major sources of of, of bankruptcy over here, of course, is getting sick, uh, and and you know, unbelievable. Uh, but I mean, we're so, we're headed that way, you know. The, yeah, I know. You know, unless we, we, you know, it's kind of why I I really got interested in economics and macro to start with. I was just thinking we should like just punctuate uh, it we, when we when we say we sound like we're down on on UBI here. 
universal basic income. That's different to basic income. And, and yeah. you know, and, and so we're not, you know, obviously people need, people are going to need basic income or and, and many j- job guarantee advocates are, yeah, yeah, we should combine it with some form of basic income. Universal basic income is the one where everybody's living in this utopian society <laughs> where robots are doing everything, including all these social right. <laughs> services that, you, that you've just outlined, John. Uh, and uh, yeah. we just need like credits to, uh, to, to spend, you know. Yeah. And if I may add in there, there's no reason why we can't count as a job taking care of your own children. Um, yes, yes, yeah. That, why should you go and get a job to be able to afford child care? Uh, and so, and obviously, these things have to be monitored. I mean, I'll just talk about this in my, in my intermediate macro class. And God, I wish I had taken my intermediate macro class when I was a student. But um, <laughs> I, I was uh, saying, you know, yeah, we got to monitor it. Uh, there are people who can abuse it, people who take advantage of it. But, you know, what is it that, that, that's saying perfect is not the, should not be the enemy of good? Uh, and this is certainly a hell of a lot better than it would be otherwise. And we already, uh, I mean, we discipline police officers for not doing their jobs. Uh, this is in the public sector. Uh, we discipline soldiers who don't do their jobs. Uh, it's not as if this is something unknown to us. As far as I understand it, and maybe you know different, but um, the core MMT scholars, uh, you know, Ray, Mosler, Kelton, Bill Mitchell, Pavlina, um, Chernova, uh, th- they all they all say uh, job the job guarantee isn't coercive in that if you decide you have an ideological <laughs> disagreement with it, you can just you know go on unemployment insurance. I guess you'd call it in the states. Or yeah. Take, yeah. If, if you want, you know, it's not like that. Now I know that Bill Mitchell has written a blog post that says if it were down to me, I would say yeah, you're only allowed so many weeks, and then you either you either have to take a job or stop taking the. Yeah, stop stop taking the money. Yeah, I would be with him on that. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me as well. But the official MMT line, according to those, say, five core economists, yeah, uh, because I'm always, I I like to sort of say, you know, I think we should respect that. I could, you know, because they've, you know, they came together and and formed it, formed MMT. And, uh, you know, and and there are some people over here. I mean, we've got an MMT economist over here I'm, I'm very fond of. Uh, um, and and we've had on our uh, show um, uh, Richard Murphy, and and I think he online he will say, "Oh no, job guarantee is not part of MMT." Uh, I, I respect him, but I, I would say I think let's be correct and say actually it is in co- according to the authors of it. <laughs> uh, you know, you might think differently, but like let's be accurate. I think. Well, and that's why I don't call myself MMT. I call myself macroeconomics done properly. Yeah. So that yeah. it leaves me free to pick and choose. Um, although if you took the Venn diagram of what I agree with, uh, and you know, you're going to have disagreement among MMT uh, scholars. I will say this too. Also with the job guarantee, uh, they want people to get training. There, are, I, I use the example here in Fort Worth, at the east side of Fort Worth, where most of the poor people live. Um, and Randy Ray had a piece years ago where he said, how many cruise missiles do we have to build before it affects Harlem? Uh, in other words, you know, we do our defense, you know, defense spending is our, our, our means of, you know, sort of stimulating the economy. It's never going to affect Harlem. No amount of military spending is ever going to cause them to become hired because. Yeah, let's trick, let's trickle up. Let's not trickle down. Anymore. Yeah, it's not working. Right, right. You know, they, they, if we want them to get jobs, uh, you know, that's the other thing too. The way we do deficit spending in America, and I'm assuming the UK, is it's like you, you want to fill a bucket with water, so you put it in your front yard and turn the sprinkler on. My God. I mean, if you want the bucket filled, just go over to the spigot, put the hose in and fill it up. And that's what the job guarantee is. Our goal is to reduce unemployment. So do it directly. And there's a wonderful piece by, by Chernova. Uh, it's a, an academic piece because she goes through Michael Koleski's um, uh, economics. And I use it in my intermediate macroeconomics class. But she comes to the conclusion that when for example, a big thing in the U.S. is uh, with both political parties, hey, let's have a big program to repair our infrastructure. And both parties seem to be all behind that. All right. So that's great. Um, but then uh, she said that actually, if you look at how the spending breaks down, most of that money goes into profits uh, or it goes into the um, uh, wages of people who need the least help. Uh, so you know, if we need infrastructure, we need infrastructure. You know, that, that's fine. That, that, that's not a criticism of that. But if we need jobs, infrastructure is a terrible way to do it. Defense spending is a terrible way to do it. Um, the way to do it is to directly create jobs. 
And so, uh, and to redefine jobs and to include training because people, maybe I'm crazy, but, but well, okay. Uh, the president's daughter said uh, just a, a month or so ago about the, the, the Green New Deal. Well, that, that, that's terrible. My experience, people want to work. Oh my God, have you, do you know what the Green New Deal is? Um, that's pretty I mean, I, I totally agree with her. I mean, she that, should yes, know. People, She's speaking from the heart, oh, from experience. Right. Yeah, hard worker there. Because um, she's been probably the head of the World Bank before too long or uh, whatever Trump wants to, to, to uh, nominate her to. That's why I prefer the job guarantee, um, is that people want to contribute and there are things that need to be done. Uh, I, and another example I give is there was a tornado a few years ago in Oklahoma that killed some children at, at a grade school. Boy, it'd be nice if they had a tornado shelter out back, uh, you know, or, or built in. Uh, but the private sector is never going to pay for that. All right, let's have the government go around and and hire people to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to imply that people only get jobs with shovels, uh, but, you know, to, to, to help build these things. Now, you know, Keynes said in the general theory, he says, people always complain, ah, but what will we do once the um, tornado shelters are all dug? Uh, and he says, people never ask, what will we do? I'm going to use a specific example, but once all the Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants are built, you know, they, they never ask that about the private sector, and yet it's the same problem. Uh, um, and what do we do when the tornado shelters are built? We celebrate because we, we added something, you know, useful to our society. And we go on to, you know, run out of social problems, we'll run into a problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you build the robot that solves all the social problems and solves climate change, then let's all have UBI. Right, right. <laughs> That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. You can become a supporter of our work by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. Get in touch with us on Twitter at MMT Podcast or I'm at Christ Riley, spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-R-E-I-L-L-Y. And Patricia is at Patricia N. Pino, spelled P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A-N-P-I-N-O. You can also email me at ChristRiley at Outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you. And I was born in Edgware General Hospital, which apparently no longer exists. That's, that'll be the Tories. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, they probably bulldozed it, and uh, there's probably a bank there now or something. Well, um, as long as there's a plaque commemorating <laughs> my birth, that'd be all right. <laughs>